Even 48 years ago, the Toronto skyline was an impressive sight. And just like today, the streets were busy. But this week was special. The Grey Cup was in town. And with the arrival of the Edmonton Eskimo fans, the party was about to begin. Varsity Stadium on the campus of the University of Toronto was the site. The newly built press box was jammed, and TV cameras would provide coast to coast and U.S. coverage for the very first time. Imagine the mindset of the players as they came out of the dressing room and the tunnel here at Varsity Stadium in 54 on a cool, damp, overcast day, much like today. 27,000 fans were here at Varsity. They estimate that 6,000 of those fans were cheering for the Eskimos. It must have seemed like 60,000 to the Edmonton team. The Eastern fans knew very little about the Eskimos' offense, led by a then young quarterback, Bernie Filoni, who was a master of deception. And the Eskimos were masters of ball control. They certainly knew a lot about the Alouette's offense, led by the one they called the rifle, Sam Echeverry. It could strike from anywhere on the field at any given time. It was an explosive offense. The Alouette's, the big four champions, were five to one favorites to beat the Eskimos that day in 1954. Come the Edmonton Eskimos out of their dressing room. We were a very, very solid team. We had we had uh, so many good Canadian players on that team. At, at that time, I think we, we could only dress eight imports, which were uh, U.S. Uh, people in the main. And uh, our Canadians were the big thing for our team in, in the early 50s. Well, we were confident in our, in our offense and felt that we could score against anybody. And uh, uh, we had thought we could just outscore the team. We didn't have to play much defense. <laughs> Well, being underdogs was uh, certainly new to us because in the West we were uh, the kings. Uh, we had a very, very good season that year. And I forgot our one loss record, but I'm sure it was very good. And we uh, caught everybody by surprise with the uh, split T offense that we, that we used. I wouldn't say we thought we were five to one. Nobody was putting any odds on it. But uh, nobody was arguing against that either. We felt strong everywhere defensively, offensively, and uh, and we were. You know, it was a very good thing. Here we go, 1954 Great Cup underway. Miles on the four-yard line. The 15 upfield to the 25. And he is dragged down to earth on the 33-yard line. Pull down. Many fans in Varsity Stadium and a good number of the Alouettes were about to get their first look at the much-talked-about Eskimos offense. With Bernie Filoni at quarterback and with Jackie Parker, Normie Kwong, and Roly Miles in the backfield. An offense that relied on ball control and used the option play to almost absolute perfection. They have moved from the 31 yard line on the original kickoff, way down now. First down on the 23 yard line, Alouette's end of the field. Back to Roly Miles. Pitches intended for complete to Parker. Great catch by Jackie. And down he goes and out of bounds on about the seven yard line. We caught the uh, Alouettes entirely by surprise with the offense that we ran because they had never seen anything like that. We ran everything on a very quick count, cut up the line of scrimmage fast, ran the play very quickly. There were times when it would be third and two and we were quite confident in being able to pick up that one or two yards. When we actually faced it, it came out a lot tougher and especially that first series of downs uh, I was a little, I, I found myself perplexed. You couldn't sort of dig in, here's what you gotta do. This is Jackie Parker carrying. Takes to get away from Hugo. Hugo hits him, he's down on the four yard line. There's a crowd of about 27,400 roughly in Varsity Stadium and I'm sure you can tell from the background they're going just a little bit wacky. This will be then third down coming. Dave Price has just reminded me that the Alouette's forward wall, when they pack it, stopped Hamilton successfully from about the same spot. It is third down, three yards to go for a touchdown. Man, this is great excitement so early. Raleigh Miles. 
He's going to be trapped. He's at his own 15. Back to the 20. Still running this way now. He throws a forward pass in the end zone. Completed to Lindley. Rowley made a fantastic play out of it because they'd covered everything pretty well and uh, he managed to scramble, get away from everybody. And, uh, and then there were some great blocks on that too. It was some of our linemen peeling back and it, that was a big play for us. I always remember Earl because um, when uh, I think Rowley threw that pass into the end zone, I thought it was coming to me and it was coming to me and Earl jumped up and caught it. So after that game, I always gave him a heck. I said, look, Earl, that was my touchdown. Five nothing in the Grey Cup so early in the ball game. This is Lindley on your screen right now, the boy who caught that pass thrown by Rolly Miles in the end zone. The clock shows five minutes and 10 seconds gone by, and Dean is trying for his 43rd consecutive convert this season. High pass. It's good. Back in those days, a touchdown was still worth five points, but the convert only won. So the Eskimos had the early lead when the Alouettes took over. Sam Achavari, playing without the injured Hal Patterson, one of his favorite targets, would call on another favorite receiver, Red O'Quinn. Joey Pal is flanked out on the near sidelines for the Alouettes, second down and eight. Jump pass to O'Quinn, he's got it! He may be away! He's at midfield, he's being chased by two Eskimos. He's at the 25-yard line, change of direction. This will be, I think, a TD, it is. Red was another fellow that had great moves, you know. If I had time to throw, uh, there was no way in the world they could cover him. No matter, he didn't have the speed Harold had, but he could get open very easily. We developed that little jump pass. If the linebacker played the nose on red, he'd play on his outside shoulder. As soon as I saw that, uh, I would just change the play and uh, jump and throw it. He'd break inside. Over the course of the afternoon, the oquinn Echeverry combination would strike 13 times and account for 316 yards, an awesome total, even by today's standards. There's Red O'Quinn on the screen now. The man who just made that long 90-yard run. Echeverry holds on the 12-yard line. The ball game is deadlocked at six points apiece. My role in the, in the Edmonton offense was uh, largely blocking for the halfbacks being able to uh, fake well enough to draw the defenders onto me when somebody else had the ball and the odd time the running back. Tommy Kwong to the 10-yard line, drives down to about the six. Larry Craig hit him down there. That is another first down and goal to go. The Alouette, you may be sure, will pack that goal line. They have seven men and they'll probably move up to about nine on the goal line. He is over I don't think they thought that, that anybody could take the football and run it that way and, and make first downs, first downs, first downs, and and we were able to go down there and and actually the momentum and, and so to speak really was on our side in in that first uh, that first half. We worked uh, an hour and a half on offense in practice and uh, 30 minutes on defense and. Uh, the coach's philosophy was uh, we'll just outscore everybody. And uh, this so happened that we run into a team that uh, controlled the ball offensively. Canadian boys. And was executing extremely well under less than ideal circumstances. When you're hit by a ball that size, you're ahead. The uh, option play had very uh, many forms. There was the option of giving it to the fullback, the first option, uh, who would be diving into the line. The second option was the quarterback could pitch it out to the halfback uh, or, or keep it and run, depending on the defensive end. We didn't even block the ends and let the uh, quarterback deal with it. And if he pitched out to the halfback, then the halfback had the option of passing or running, whichever he saw fit to do. So it was quite a, uh, a lot of variations, and, and a lot of them were very effective in, in playing football. Playing Edmonton, we were very well aware that they were different. Uh, the offensive formation they used, it was sort of more or less a split T, and uh, 
no real straight drop back passes. It was very hard to rush the pass and you couldn't get lined up. Even when they did pass, there was three fakes at a run which you had to watch and then you had to rush. It was a little different. More of the 54 Grey Cup when we return. We're now in the second quarter of the 54 Grey Cup. Edmonton leading by five. In those days, there was no such thing as a soccer style place kicker. Bob Dean was straight on and was long and usually accurate. This attempt was from 37 yards. There's the kick, there goes the ball. And it's in there for three points. Number 81 is Earl Lindley, who scored one of the two touchdowns the Eskimos have picked up. That's a six yard gain. It'll be second down and 40 goal. On their own, 33. Now Echeverry stays in the pocket. He's going to pass down the middle, and it's a great one-handed catch by Webster. We didn't really uh, work on any particular weakness. Uh, we thought that we had a, an offense that whatever we, could, we ran or threw, uh, we could uh, be successful. And they're trailing by a score of 14 to 6, playing in the second quarter. First and 10 for the Alouettes. Joey Powell flanks to the right. Huntinger is wide to the right. Here's Echeverry in the slot. There's the throw. And good to O'Quinn. O'Quinn is brought down on the 30. Sam was an explosive type quarterback. Very exciting quarterback. He had to have the tools. And he did have the tools. And their names were Red O'Quinn, Joey Powell, Chuck Huntinger, and Alex Webster. You add them up and you've got an explosive offense. Joey Powell flanks out to the left, and here's Echeverry staying in the pocket. The pass is down the middle, and it's a great catch by Red O'Quinn over the goal line. Catch is on the one. Did you see that catch? Here's O'Quinn. Number 73. What a catch of this boy is. He hauls him in like an outfielder. So the score is Edmonton 14, Montreal 11. Here's Red O'Quinn on the screen, a second touchdown of the ball game. No, Red was, was also a great receiver. Uh, I know that if I didn't throw the ball enough to him, he'd say, oh, buddy, he says, I'm, I'm open. <laughs> we had a lot of confidence in our defense. We, in that game, after playing so many games during the season, we had a lot of guys really beat up and sore, and, and we lost some more in the game. And, you know, you're not going to stop uh, Echeverry. Echeverry's going to throw the football, and, uh, and he was absolutely excellent at it. At one point, they wanted to call him Slingin' Sam after Slingin' Sammy Ball of NFL fame. Fortunately, the rifle stuck. But Echeverry could also run when needed. Webster and Powell flank wide to the left. Wagner in motion, and here's Echeverry going to pass. He can't find a receiver. He takes off. He's on the 25, and he's brought down on about the 28. Sam, the rifle Echeverry. A down by Lindley. Earl Lindley, and it's close to a first down. The ball is on about the Montreal 29-yard line. There's Hugo over the ball. They're going to run it. There's the pitch out, and uh, it's over to Webster. Webster makes up the first down. Dive play over the uh, right side of the Evanson line. Picks up about four yards. Stopped by Wilsey. So it's first and ten for the Montreal Alouettes. On their own, 33. Both these clubs are gambling today. In other words, on those uh, third down plays, where the yard or two to go, they're both going. Both teams are going for it. Double flankers to the left. Hunsinger and Pal. There's the pitch down the middle, and it's taken by Poole. He's on the 45. He's up to about the 48 yard line before you stop by Bright and uh, Jackie Parker. Using all the considerable weapons at his disposal and a couple of Edmonton penalties, Echeverry, with less than a minute to go in the first half, has the Alouettes in scoring position. Webster flanks wide, and uh, here is the pitch out to Hunsinger. He's on the five, he's getting some good blocking, and he's over for a touchdown. Doesn't that crowd roar? Well, the Montreal Alouettes go to the front for the first time in the ballgame. 
On the last play of the half, Edmonton had a chance to move to within a single point. But this time, the field goal attempt from Dean is wide and short. In historical terms, it had been a wide open, high scoring game to this point. And the score at the end of the first half of this Grey Cup game from Varsity Stadium in Toronto is Montreal 18, the Edmonton Eskimos 14. 18 to 14 in favor of the Montreal Alouettes. Well, the mood was uh, still, uh, you know, that we we could we were going to win the game. Uh, just the fact that uh, we didn't need to get needed to get the ball more often, you know. The the game went uh, actually according to uh, Pop Ivy's game plan. He figured that this this is what would happen, and we'd have to just uh, ball control uh, the game as much as we could. Time of possession wasn't a huge statistic in the CFL 48 years ago, but it was certainly a key for the Eskimos in 54, and it clearly frustrated the Alouettes. But things would change quickly in the third quarter. McWinney is the applying wing to the left. There's Filoni on the keeper play now, stays in there. There's the throw down the middle, and it's intercepted by Hugo. And uh, he's on the 42-yard line, 47-yard line. Man, that was a nice tackle. Ted Tully calling the defense for the uh, Eskimos. Two wide men here in the swing. There's the pitch, and it's intercepted by Edmonton. Intercepted by Johnny Bright. By the time the third quarter rolled around, it, it was uh, we had some people hurt. And it was a, the field was a very kind of greasy field, and and ball. I think the ball must have gotten a little harder to hold on to because even even a couple of their great receivers dropped one or two. Well, there's the pass, and it is incomplete. Obviously, both coaches made the necessary adjustments at halftime. The third quarter resulted in tighter coverage on defense, and what had been a battle of offenses in the first half became a defensive struggle in the second, with fumbles and interceptions from both sides. The scoring binge turned into a drought. Back to the deadline for a single point, and the score, Montreal 19, Edmonton Eskimos 14. That's the first point. Only one point was posted in the third quarter, that from a missed Montreal field goal. But it was only a matter of time before the rifle would reload and find the range against the Eskimos defense. Just off your screen to the near sidelines are Pal and Alec Webster. Sam throws down the middle, complete to Aquino, who juggled it and held on finally at the Eskimos 50-yard line. And Lindley, once again, is the number one man to hit him. That boy has played a whale of a ball game for Edmonton today. Red was a very, he was excellent at getting clear. He had a quick fake and a move, and he got clear. You know, you, you'd think they'd be watching Red O'Quinn. Well, they were, but he, he still got clear. Sam throws to Joey Powell, complete, and he is downed on the 27-yard line. Lindley again. Ball is in the 28-yard line, Alouette's possession. That's the Eskimo 28, first and 10. Pal is a wide flanker toward the near side. Alec Webster, quick opener to the right-hand side of the line. The hole open between tackle and end. It's a first down to the 13-yard line where Kruger, Oscar Kruger, 96, and that same Lindley finally put the stop on him. You know, we had two halfbacks and three receivers and... Uh... Always uh, got the brunt of the fact if I didn't throw it to one guy, he'd always say something. <laughs> and this far, about two minutes in the fourth, seemed to have the pepper that they showed in the first half. Webster and Powell are wide flankers. Throwing for Powell, complete for a touchdown. Joey Powell, number 82, the great Canadian flying wing of the Montreal Alouettes on a typical pass play with Sam Echeverry. And we remember seeing them pull it many times during this season. He comes out to the near sidelines as a wide flanker, 24 to 14 on that TD. Goes down about uh, eight or 10 steps, then cuts directly in to the secondary where the hole is opened up. And he took that one with nobody within five yards of him. Ray Poole on the conversion, Echeverry holds from the 12 yard line. It is good. Montreal by 25 to 14. Joey Powell on your screen at this moment. Number 82 played for Montreal when they won the Grey Cup back in 1949 and is the only non-U.S. starter, offensively speaking, for the Alouettes in all big four games this year. 
Our coverage of the 54 Grey Cup will continue. The hole the Eskimos had dug for themselves was 11 points deep. Montreal 25, Edmonton 14. But there was plenty of time remaining in the fourth quarter. Time enough for a relative unknown to make his mark. Here we go, first and ten for Edmonton from their own 25-yard line. Sudden burst to the middle by little Glenn Lipman. He's still going. Man, how that little guy goes. He's to the 47-yard line. We were very confident only because uh, the um, games that we had played uh, many times in the West, we, we'd be down, but we were always able to come back and win. So it, it was just a team that had that winning attitude, and uh, nobody ever gave up. Alouette's using a five-man line, a 5-4 defense. That's Filoni with the ball, running wide. Nice block by Parker. Bernie's going to run it. He is almost good for the first down across midfield to the Alouette's 53-yard line. Ted Elsby, the man who made the stop on him. First down it is. Nice run by Bernie Filoni. Eskimos are trailing by 11 points with a little less than 10 minutes to go, but... From what we saw earlier today, anything could and possibly will happen in this football game for sure. Whole backfield moves in motion to these sidelines. Maloney looks, throws, complete and a beautiful kick by Glenn McQuinney, who did a great tumble, as you saw, onto the cinder track, but held onto the football for a first down. At the end, when we were, we were down and we needed something to happen, Bernie's Stuck right to that running game, and Lipman did a great job in there running with the football and our offensive line. But the, uh, Bernie stuck with the stuff that had got us to the Grey Cup, and it paid off. Nick Winnie is a flanker just off the top of your screen. Take Judd is to Parker. Lots of running room. He's to the 30. Chased by Hunsinger across the 20. Knocked out of bounds by Colter. Loose ball, but I believe the play has been stopped on the 13-yard line. A great run by Jackie Parker. A 25-yard sweep around his own right end. Parker had all the room in the world, and gee, he sure traveled. Lindley is coming in, and Fraser goes out of the Eskimo lineup. Crowd begins to buzz again. Maloney hands off to Lipman. The little guy's to the five-yard line. He's over. <laughs> Twenty-five to nineteen. Glenn Lipman was uh, probably the biggest surprise in in our team. Uh, this, the thing that people, most people, don't know is that he had very huge legs and, and he could run like the wind and he proved it on that one touchdown he scored in that uh, particular game. That offense of theirs uh, was outstanding and uh, they controlled the ball. Uh, they ran, uh, they ran seemed like 75% of the time but uh, would set up their passing plays. Uh. And with automatic Bob Dean coming in, it should go to 25 to 20. He does, it's good. That is Dean's 44th consecutive conversion this year. He converted the first Edmonton touchdown today. There's the little scooter from way down Texas way, the Aggies, Glenn Lipman. Lipman, the instant hero for the Eskimos, getting a chance to play because the likes of Parker, Lindley, and Miles were playing both defense and offense, and fatigue was now a factor. Montreal was on the move and would use a little razzle dazzle to move even further. Ball is in the 25 yard line, second down, three yards to go, 15 yards in from the far sideline. Webster, nice hole. Lateral to Joey Powell, he's at the 40. Down on the 52 yard line. Lindley again. We have six minutes left in the ball game. Montreal in front of Edmonton by 25 to 20. Back in 1949, Montreal beat Calgary 28 to 15. Freest scoring game on both sides, but this is even better. Etcheverry throws for Powell, great catch. And down he goes on the 37-yard line. 
Mendrick just came in for Edmonton and made the stop. Officials mark it down on the 36, where it is another Alouette first down. Healy is the ball carrier. Fumble! Eskimo recovery, so indicated by the referee. And this crowd, which obviously is predominantly for the West, goes slightly wild once again. We felt almost like the home team in, in Toronto that year because of that support. We could hear the crowd appreciate every time we made a good run or or did something major on uh, defense or offense. So we felt almost like the home team that year. Still down by five points, with time now very much a factor. The Eskimos were taking advantage of that fan support. Loose ball, recovered by Ted Elsby, number 68, who fell on one of his teammates, and let's give the credit to his teammate as soon as he comes up, Jimmy Miller. Intercollegiate boxing champion at McGill three times, and he made the recovery, so Alouettes take over. This Grey Cup football game is coming to you from Varsity Stadium in Toronto. Now the Montreal Alouettes had possession and a chance to put the Eskimos away. Pal is flanked way out on these sidelines. Sam looks, throws down the middle. Complete to a win. He's down, but not before he picks up a first down on the 21-yard line. Oscar Kruger, defensive back, number 96, makes the tackle. At this point, Echeverry had the Alouette's offense looking more like the Eskimos. His play selection had Edmonton on the ropes. The Big Four champions were closing in for the knockout blow. This is Hunsinger with the ball. Holder leads the blocking. Hunsinger is still going down to about the 14. Mendrick stops him there. Chuck tried to get some more yardage. We'll see what the officials say about it. They are going to allow it, I believe, to the 10-yard line. The ball is not quite to the 10-yard line, so a first down will leave it short of the goal line by about maybe one foot. Time remaining unofficially, three and a half minutes. Montreal 25, Edmonton 20. Hunsinger nailed behind the line of scrimmage. Tries the lateral, the ball is loose. Jackie Parker has got it for Edmonton. Jackie Parker in this stadium is going crazy. About 95 yards. This is an absolute madhouse. I had no sooner handed the ball off and uh, the tackle broke through and tackled Hunsinger at the uh, ankles. And I watched Chuck and uh, he was falling and he threw the ball with both hands to the two guards needing uh, interference. You know, it's hard to tell people today that it wasn't a fumble, it was a forward pass, illegal forward pass. And you know, on the film, you can't, Chuck's back was towards you so you couldn't see his hand. Him throw the ball, but it was obvious uh, the ball traveled too far for a fumble. He might have been trying to pitch it to somebody or whatever, but what caused the ball to go on the ground was our guys hitting him. Not so I don't know how you could rule that as a forward pass, incomplete forward pass. You know, Prazer and, and, and Tully uh, hit the Hunsinger about five yards by the line of scrimmage. One hit him high, one hit him low, and the ball comes out. I just happened to be there and uh, picked it up and ran it down the field. I saw Sam coming over, but he, he, was, uh, he was quite a ways from, from me. And uh, uh, I, I, at that time of the game, I don't know whether I was fast or not, but, but I had fairly good speed, and I don't really think he, he would have had a chance to catch me from where he was. Ray left one man totally unblocked. That's the guy that got in quickly and, and tackled Hunsinger right away. Of course, Hunsinger should have, that doesn't alleviate Hunsinger's responsibility for throwing the ball away. We'd have lost two yards, and we'd have tried the field goal from the uh, 12 instead of the 10. But that's how the play developed. One mistake causing another mistake, which made the big mistake. High ball game. How do you like that? Dean has his big chance right now. Edmonton leads the great 
break up 26 to 25. There's Jackie Parker on the screen, uh, Steve. And man, this is no place for weak hearts, I don't think. Uh, that's the Western gang here is certainly getting the kicks right now. Well, how long it'll last is hard to say. Eskimos take the lead 26 to 25. And I think it's just about three minutes remaining in this fourth and final quarter. If this score stands as it is right now. In their first possession following the, the TD, the Owls fumbled and were then pinned deep in their own zone by a Bernie Filoni punt. Could Echeverry rally the Owls with one more drive and at least get his team to within field goal range? They trail by the slimmest of margins, a single point. Sam will throw. He's back to his five yard. He's going to run it at the 20. 25 still going at the 30. Spilled out of bounds. Bob Hayton, number 94, knocked him out. The officials say the 33-yard line, Alouette's first down. Less than one minute to go, 26-25, Edmonton. Bernie Filoni has gone in for Edmonton to play a defensive position for the first time today. Hodgson has come in, replacing Bob Dean for Edmonton in the line. Etcheverry will throw. He does deep. It's intended for Moran. Over his head. Intercepted. But there's a marker on the field. And there may be a little bit of a scramble as well. This play is going to have to be carried out in spite of the fact the gun sounded to officially end the game. Interference is being called. Interference was called against Mike King. So the Alouettes have one more fading chance. Oh, this is a real humdinger. You won't see a blade of grass after this play because the crowd will be on that field. Etcher's throwing very long, intended for Webster. The ball goes loose. There's the gun. The game is over. The final score of this great cup game from Varsity Stadium, Toronto, is the Edmonton Eskimos, 26, Montreal Alouettes, 25. I was at a do once, and a guy hollered at me, and he wanted to introduce me to his friend. And he's introduced me to his friend, and the guy looked at me like this, and he says, you never won a great cup. <laughs> I always remember that. <laughs> it hit me right there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I never had any idea of the impact that it would have. You see, that was my first year, and I didn't realize how rabid uh, the fans were in, in Edmonton. And, uh, I mean, it was a huge deal. It was a pretty wonderful football game here this afternoon, and one that will have the fans talking not only in Toronto and Varsity Stadium, but all across the network in Canada, and certainly all across the network in the United States. Anytime you can do that and beat the odds, it is uh, much more satisfying than just playing a team that you were supposed to beat or being pretty close to. And uh, looking at their team and the talent that they had, it still amazes me how we beat them. But then we did, we beat them the next two years too, so I guess it wasn't a fluke. In 1954, many Canadians and viewers in the United States saw their first ever CFL Grey Cup game. And they saw a good one. Spectacular offensive play, solid defense, and one of the most talked about and controversial plays in the history of the Grey Cup. That day, Varsity Stadium hosted its 27th Grey Cup. It would go on to host three more before moving to Exhibition Stadium and Sky Dome. Varsity Stadium, as we know it, is about to disappear. But the mountain of football memories, including those of the 1954 Grey Cup game, will remain. And Steve Armitage joins me live in the studio. By the way, the play-by-play -play in that game by the late Steve Douglas from CBC and the late Winnipeg legend, John Wells' father, who's now at TSN, Cactus Jack Wells. Now, you join me. I notice replays. 
There weren't replays. I, I thought I thought Rune Arledge invented replays in the 60s. He did, and uh, if you were at Varsity that day and you were looking for it on the big screen, of course it wasn't there. A, they didn't have replays. I, I should say that the TV coverage in that year, in 1954, was outstanding. CBC did a terrific job, but replays, ISO cameras, bench cameras, handheld cameras all came much, much later. We put those replays in. Denny Lavoire, producer, did a terrific job, and he created those replays. I'm not sure you people at home realize this, but uh, Steve Armitage quarterbacked St. Mary's University. Now, you were telling me as we watched this that the rifle was your boyhood hero. Explain to me what he did that was so unique. and Maybe get a wider shot on Steve. What he did with the ball when he went back. Well, it was something I wanted to do, and I tried to do for years. I could never do it. Only Sam Echeverry could do it. When he drifted back, he would take the ball back on his hip and like a rifle would hold it there then come up then cock when I played and, and many quarterbacks today watch two quarterbacks tomorrow they'll go back carry the ball very high to get that quick release Etcheverry had that great skill of being able to take it back sort of sling it on his hip and then come up and release and, and throw the ball as hard as anybody has in the CFML maybe Dieter Brock threw it uh, a little harder than Sam many many years later I can remember going to Clark Stadium as a boy in the 50s. I'm dating myself to watch uh, the China Clipper, uh, Johnny Bright, Rolly Miles, Parker. Most people, though, think of Parker as a quarterback. He played two ways in this game, but uh, and Filoni is the Hamilton quarterback. Amazing, isn't it? We, when we think of Jackie Parker uh, now, we think of him as a great quarterback. But in those days, he was the running back and a defensive halfback. He, he would become the Eskimos quarterback a year later. You said to me as we watched this that one thing struck you about uh, Jimmy Miller, Normie Kwong, Jackie Parker, and the rifle Sam Etcher. Reluctant heroes. When you talk to them 48 years later about a great game in 1954, it's gosh golly gee whiz, ah shucks. You know, I wasn't really that great. I had great teammates. I wasn't, I wasn't that outstanding, but they were. Because Sam Etcheverry, Normie Kwong, and Jackie Parker became legends in the CFL, and still are. Jimmy Miller's here in Montreal. The rifle's here. Uh, uh, Normie's not in Edmonton, but he's in Alberta, I believe. You can tell in me Calvary, where. Just in, outside of Calgary. All right, and, and uh, the legend is in Edmonton. That's unique today, isn't it? Yes, they stayed in Canada. They're very proud to be Canadians. Uh, I don't think there are, two of them aren't Canadian citizens, but they still live and work in Canada. This is where their roots are now. All the kids uh, grew up, and they're all great grandfather or grandfathers, and, and they all live in Canada. You know, uh, I'm not sure people watching have ever heard him, but Normie Kwong went on to become one of the great after-dinner speakers. And, and he had that self-deprecating humor. Yes, you talked about the absolutely. humility. Yeah, the, the gosh golly gee whiz ah shucks kind of thing. And uh, yeah, very, a very funny and talented uh, speaker. Just a couple of uh, seconds to go. Chuck Hunsinger, is he alive or dead? No, uh, Chuck uh, passed away some time ago. And, and that fumble, he was reminded about many, many years later because it was seen in the United States. That game was televised by NBC back in 1954. What about Pop Ivy? Pop Ivy living in Florida. Really? Yes. Oh. Listen, we enjoyed it. Uh, the classic from... That was uh, a lot of fun for me, Brian. It was an excellent job. 1954, Steve Armitage. Thank you. The Edmonton Eskimos defeating Montreal by a score of 26 to 25. Up.